creativity and being a human being. Like, why, why is that weird chubby dude doing that? And um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't exactly know why, but I'll say um, a little bit about that. That um, you know, it's something that's always interested me. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I grew up um, uh, in a very kind of I would say eclectic bohemian type family in Seattle uh, in the uh, in the in the in the 70s, and uh, we, um, you know, they had uh, they were they were members of the Baha'i faith, and we had um, yo some Baha'is in the house. <laughs> um, they uh, they. Um, um, That's, uh, and, uh, but we had a lot of, um, so we had a lot of, uh, interesting ways of looking at, you know, religious beliefs and philosophy, and my dad had, you know, book collection of, you know, philosophers and mystics and poetry and, you know, Sufi poetry collection and stuff like that. I mean, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was, a, he was an artist and, uh, and he was also a sewer truck dispatcher which made for a very heady combination. And, uh, and then I, you know, in high school, I, you know, I took a lot of classes. Like I took um, uh, great books, um, which was a great option at my high school, where instead of English, you took great books. So you would just read books and debate them and, uh, and talk about them. And you were really graded on the ideas contained in a philosophical book or in a, a book of the Bible or, you know, on Moby Dick or something like that. And, um, <laughs> my throw, my throw her out of here. Um, my bouncer, girl with the purple hair, throw her out of here. Um, so it was really, um, uh, that was really, uh, it was really important to me. And then, you know, I moved to New York City and, um, you know, was really into being an artist and bohemian type and, um, you know, dyed my hair and talked about, check off till three o'clock in the morning and um, and so that was that whole facet of my life and I talk a lot about this I wrote a little introduction to the book uh, and I talk about that kind of a journey and um, uh, so when I had the opportunity to become uh, well known because of the office I just thought well we haven't we have a chance here to do something really special with this and uh, Devin and I had become friends at that point, and um, he shared a, a lot of the same interests. And he's, you know, just a brilliant mind, and he can work in computers and compose music and direct things and take pictures and you know do almost everything. And and we were like, we want to do something really special uh, on the internet because uh, Soul Pancake m m mostly is or was a, a website, and we wanted to. Um, we wanted to do something to make the internet a better place. You know, the internet is mostly a lot of like car insurance ads, and it's just a lot of crap, and it's just kind of the worst of humanity. And we wanted to do something uplifting and interesting. Um, and these issues um, around, you know, spirituality and philosophy, you know, they always find like philosophy is is like is the most boring class you'll ever take in your life, and it's just so. It's so wrong-headed and it's so dryly academic. I'm sorry, philosophy professors that are here, but it's true. And you know, you read Heidegger and you talk about phenomenology and you look at, you know, it's it it has no application to the real world. And um, uh, then you and then um, conversely, the other way of looking at you know philosophy and and life's big questions is in a really like new agey, touchy-feely, airy-fairy, kind of hippy-dippy way that is really makes me vomit by a lot of my nose. So um, we wanted to do something that really was in between. Like, what is it just for real people? Just like, you know, you, you, you work good at Starbucks and you're wondering what your life is all about and you want to, um, you know, kind of dig into what it is to be a human being. Like, um, how can we... Uh, uplift the conversation and it was through dealing with life's big questions that uh, we found the way of uh, the way in uh, that we at Soul Pancake don't have any answers um, it, it's just about a place for people to 
you know, upload their minds, as we say, you know, download your, your souls uh, into, the, into the website. And so that's kind, of, that's kind of how it came about. Right, what else, what am I missing? Anything else, you guys? These are my co-authors of the book. Can you wave your hands in the air like you just don't care? And uh, shout out. say that I couldn't have done it without them is like the understatement of the century because they did most of it, so I just get the credit. But um, they are brilliant, brilliant minds and they run the site and recently they are just finishing producing um, these short uh, video webisodes for Oprah Winfrey Network that we're doing um, on their um, website and uh, eventually hope to turn into some kind of TV thing. So we're turning the soul pancake uh, thing into, it, into a brand, really, you know, that stands for a, an irreverent, fun, fresh look at dealing with being a human being and philosophy and, and creativity and the arts and how to express the arts through everything and, and the, the ideas behind what it is to, to be a human being. And so that's... That's what it's all about, because I hope that answered a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from the book. Looks like my nice little pancake bitches figured out what I should read here. They underline my favorite part, but their favorite parts. So I'm just going to read what they'll, they've told me to read here, which I've never done before, but... I think this is shot nuns work. So, here goes. Here's a little bit from my introduction. Mostly the mostly the book itself, as you'll find, it's for sale here. How much are you selling it for? Full price. Full price? You should have charged a, uh, uh, what is it, a surplus? A premium. Premium. 19.99. That's right. 19.99. That's the price of a latte. Okay. <laughs> so, Pick yourself, do yourself a favor. Um, buy yourself a stocking stuffer for the 2011 Christmas season. Um, 1999. What was I going to say? It's mostly an art book. It's mostly a workbook. It's filled with quotes and questions and uh, arresting images and facts and little mini essays and stuff. It's not like a a book that you read like Harry Potter. It's, uh, it's a little bit different than that. So, good, someone get that. Um, here we go. You're asking for directions. Um, at age 20, I dropped out of college and came to a crossroads. I could either go to India with my best friend and travel the world for a year or two, or I could go to the graduate acting program at New York University. I was going back and forth on this choice for several months when I had a curious spiritual epiphany. It wasn't on a mountaintop or anywhere biblical. It was at a multiplex in Boston during the 3.30 p.m. of A Chorus Line, the movie. Spoiler alert, it's a terrible movie, don't see it. The whole thing is filled with singing and dancing actors talking about singing and dancing and acting. They sang about making it and auditioning and sending in clowns, stuff like that. But it still managed to touch my heart. I walked out into Boston at twilight with the snow beginning to fall and I saw everything with crystal clarity. Tears rolled down my face and I knew I had to give acting a try. I was filled with purpose and meaning and passion and vision after watching one of the worst movies of the 1980s. <laughs> True story. I arrived in New York City in 1986 and promptly dyed my hair black. It seemed like the right thing to do at the time. I think it was a basic box of Clairol Midnight Black, complete with the rubber gloves and the 800 number to call if something goes wrong. <laughs> something went wrong. I had forgotten about my eyebrows, which were fluffy and red. I was going for cool and mysterious, but I looked more like a psycho killer. <laughs> who had just written a violent manifesto on the walls of his cabin in blood and feces. It was also around this time that I turned my back on religion. Like so many 20-something-year-olds who moved to the big city, there simply was no place in my life for morality, God, prayer, or faith. All I saw in religion was hypocrisy. 
To my crowd of artist friends, belief in God or religion seemed like a throwback to a previous generation. It was quaint and obsolete, a weakness of our parents and grandparents. It was a simplistic way to moralize and to live for some superstition-filled fantasy land of heaven with God, the ultimate daddy figure, patting you on the back and telling you that you were a good kid. Faith was a crutch for the weak. Religion was there to make you feel bad and keep you oppressed. Believers were judgmental simpletons who lived in big square states in the center of our country and equated Jesus with gun rights and hated gays and oppressed people of color and wanted women to stay in the kitchen. Religion's time had come and gone. We had found a new religion, theater. We did fierce plays that probed the deep recesses of the human mind and soul. We created art that could change lives in a pure and visceral way. We truly believed that if we could perform, say, Hedda Gobbler, in just the right way, in just the right audience, and just the right night, that we could change someone's heart and soul and life. Brecht was our Buddha, Shakespeare was our Abraham, Chekhov was our Christ, Pinter was our, well, you get the idea. I took all my belief in the transformative power of religion and put it into the transformative power of theater. Uh, it was also during this time that I started in with the proclivities that of most formerly religious artists living in the big city, sex and drugs and rock and roll and drink, lots and lots of drink. It's an old story, I won't go into detail here, but suffice to say, what were supposed to be good carefree days of fun for a young actor turned south and sour rather quickly. I also felt something missing in my life. I felt empty. Here I was, living my dream of being a working actor in New York. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> what did I do? Um, um, here I was, um, living my dream of being a working actor in New York, just like those singers and dancers in a chorus line. But theater as religion wasn't cutting it for me. I had a yearning to, um, that I couldn't quite express. So I decided to re-explore this whole God thing. Um, it was also around this time that I decided to move that one very difficult step from avowed atheist to agnostic. Um, oh, and I have a note in here too, I'm gonna read this. Note, note four. Somewhere around this time I began dating my eventual wife, the beautiful and brilliant writer, Holiday Reinhorn. Um, my artistic and spiritual soulmate who was a tremendous loving influence on my growth. She greatly encouraged me forward in this quest and it's a journey we're taking together. She's awesome and she's a much better writer than me. Um, it was also around this time I decided to move that one very difficult step from avowed atheist to agnostic. I started to ask my friends about God. To a person, they all had the same response. Well, I kind of believe in God. I mean, I don't believe in a judgmental old man with a beard who's looking down from a cloud scowling at us, but I kind of believe in a powerful creative force out there in the stars and nature and the universe, kind of. It was all very vague. I decided I couldn't really live as an agnostic. I had to know the answer to one of life's all time's biggest questions. I didn't want to be like so many others and have some unexplored, unexamined, philosophical stance on something that was truly important. I mean, there either, either has to be a creator or the universe has always been as it is, beautiful and purposeless. And the fact that we are conscious and breathing and listening to Abbey Road and eating red velvet cake while well, the breeze blows in our hair is just a chance coincidence of molecules. And when we die, it's lights out, game over, that's it. Doesn't there need to be a source to the mystery of it all? I mean, you can't kinda be pregnant. You either are or you aren't. It seemed to me that God was the same. There either is or there isn't a creator. It also seemed to me that one of the great mysteries of this creator in the physical world is that we're all given the choice to seek this God and to make this decision for ourselves. That's all they have highlighted. <laughs> so that's it, thank you.